Welcome to the Mastering the Game of Life podcast. In this podcast, there'll be insights around three key areas to mastering the game of life. Purpose, prosperity, philanthropy. Your host, Paul Lowe, the third sector mentor, is the founder of Hearts Global CIC, which along with many other of his charitable commitments, has been responsible for positively impacting thousands of people's lives, particularly young people from disadvantaged communities. Author of Mastering the Game of Life, From Pain to Purpose, and Speaking from Our Hearts books. Introducing your host, Paul Lowe. Welcome podcast listeners to Mastering the Game of Life. And today I'll be speaking to a lady called Jane McGraw. And Jane will be talking to us around a very, very, I think concerning is probably the right adjective to use, topic that affects, if not directly, then certainly indirectly, every single one of us, because we all know somebody that uh, that is suffering from or has suffered from cancer. So Jane will be giving us insights around ca cancer diagnosis and the fact that it's not a death sentence. So Jane, without further ado, it's over to you. Can you, uh, can you give us an insight, please, into uh, firstly who you are uh, for the benefit of, of our podcast listeners and um, your experience of, of cancer? Absolutely, Paul, and thank you very much for inviting me here. Uh, my sort of story with this started way back in the 70s when my father was diagnosed. Um, he went through all the treatments, the, the chemotherapy, the surgery and the radiotherapy. He had lung cancer and esophageal cancer. Unfortunately, it came back. Um, we lost him. He died in 1981. He'd been at the Brompton, and we knew a couple of scientists who worked down there, and we got to know them very well. And we wanted to know more about it. So that was my starting on my um, research trip. And then, lo and behold, 30 years later in 2009, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, it wasn't desperately serious, but they did want to get me in fairly soon. Um, I'd actually known that I had cancer for about a month beforehand. Uh, I know it sounds weird, that, but you get a feeling your hormones are doing things, your whole body is doing it. I was having panic attacks, all sorts of things were, were, that weren't me. So I straight away went and um, got it checked out and had a mammogram and stuff, and lo and behold, there it was. I went through all three... Um, again, of the chemo surgery and um, the radiotherapy. I had some severe after effects from the chemo. Uh, I'm still having them now, but that hasn't stopped me getting on with my life most of the time. Surgery was fine, um, but then I developed a hematoma. Again, I've still got that. But I always say at this point, bear in mind that's my. This is my story. Everyone is different, so some people will sail through anything that they need treatment they're getting, no problems. And because I'd done the research before, I decided I'm going to really look into this. Is it necessary to have to go through what I've been going through after the, the chemo? And I started talking with people in the chemo suite. And there were five people there, and we became great friends, and my chemo pals, as I called them. And we talked about, to start with, we talked about what was going on, how we were feeling. And bit by bit, we sort of picked little bits out of how the process was. Were we getting the information? Were we, were we happy with everything? Could we be doing anything more for ourselves? Now, our, the chemo suite nurses were brilliant. The cancer care team was brilliant. I picked no holes in them at all. They couldn't have been better. But it's a system. There's so many people being pushed through. Just now and then, there are some things that might not be going as well as we like. So we actually kept journals the whole way through of what we did every single day when we got up, what the weather was like, what we had to eat. Uh, in my case, I had a large dog, so how long a walk we went for and where, we, where did we actually go? This had a dual purpose. A, it sort of was a dear diary for us, but also it could be um, an, a trigger for our care teams. If one day we weren't feeling well, something seemed wrong, we weren't quite sure what, we could then look back and see what had happened within the last week and thereby do a bit of detective work, CSI type thing, and just sort of see if it was something we could deal with straight away. Okay. Uh, if I can just come in at that point, Jane. Mm. 
Um, from a personal point of view, and I'm trying to create obviously some insights and some uh, some empathy for our listeners that uh, you know, with all due respect, have not had the misfortune to have uh, gone down this particular path. My only experience was when my late mother had lung cancer and she died at the relatively tender age of 64. Mm. Now, when I try to support her through throughout this ordeal, she was very much of a um, an attitude, a mindset of one of those things, don't want to talk about it, just get on with it. <laughs> yes. And, I mean, I don't know if that's indicative of, you know, a 30s child, so to speak, um, or not, because, you know, I do confess, as I say, I've, I haven't got this deep knowledge around this this particular subject, apart from that personal experience. So I suppose my question to you, Jane, is if you could share with us, and you've already alluded, and I think that's quite right, it's, you know, it's a totally unique experience for, for every single person, I would imagine, but some insights into your sort of how you felt, you know, was the, um, was the pain psychological, was it physical, was it both? Can, can you try and share with us, Jane, some of those deeper insights so you know we can try and gain that and I, and I reinforce the word try and gain that deeper empathy around what was actually going on here yeah absolutely Paul um as you were saying about your mother it was a 30s thing if I start with that yes it was partly because if you go back beyond well certainly beyond my father so let's go back before the 80s say um very few people talked about what was wrong with them Cancer was a dirty word. You didn't talk about it in public. It was the big C. It was just, I, mean, I used to get those awful looks when I was talking about cancer with my family. People looked and said, should you be talking about cancer in public like that? So I said, yeah, absolutely. But we were sort of a bit ahead of the thing. So yes, it was. Uh, go back to 30s, 40s, 50s. No one talked about their ailments. It was not um, dinner table talk or, you know, cocktail party. Um, as far as I was concerned, I was very lucky. I come from a medical background. Um, because I'd done the research from, from my father's time, I was in a position that I sort of knew a lot of what was happening. Of course, there was a lot more. And I, it was my decision to go through chemotherapy, surgery, and radiotherapy. I did have... The opportunity to do other things but I didn't want to I know it sounds really weird and masochistic or whatever the word is um I I had a really good run through um I met my oncologist I then met my surgeon uh the you get to meet all the people of your cancer care team who are going to be looking after you throughout and that is important. Uh, I never remembered any names, but it didn't matter. They had badges. They were a wonderful team. If you had any problems, you could go straight to them. You're not left alone. You're not just bumped at the doorstep, put through into the machine and, you know, then had the needle in your arm and all that sort of thing. There is a lot of care go that goes on with it. This didn't happen in your, when your mother was young or anything like that. It happens now a lot. And they realise the effect that this has on people, even if they know that it's not as bad as it used to be because uh, research has come up with better solutions. Um, I had surgery, and the only thing bad about the surgery was when I was in the recovery room, a nurse was screaming in my ear as I was coming round to another nurse down the other end, and I just had to turn around to her and say, shut up. You know, let me wake up naturally. That was the only, what happened, but they do that all the time anyway. Radiotherapy was a bore. It happened every day for however many months it was, every weekday. But because things were going so well, I got out of having to do the last part of it. So I was very lucky in certain ways. Um, it, at the time, I was not bothered by it. I didn't have a psychological thing of, oh, am I really in pain? I knew I was in pain and I knew why. Um, but then it really hit me about 12 months after, six to 12 months after, and I found that my nervous system 
and my immune system had been totally shocked by the chemotherapy. My immune system, system actually was very good. It came back and looked after me very well after that. But my, my um, nervous system is still very wacky and not in sync. And I do have severe problems. I'm still having... Um, I really didn't get a chance to re recover properly from it because not long, about two years afterwards, my sister was um, diagnosed as being terminally ill and I had to look after her. So that added more what have you to it. But um, the nice thing about this today is there are pe people, people to talk to. You've got Macmillan um, support. You've got them online or you can go see them. There is so much out there that you don't need to feel alone. I, I think it's wonderful. With a supportive family and friends, you soon find out who your friends really are at times like this. But it's, it's not as bad as it used to be. And even though it may be serious or stage two, three, whatever you happen to be, even if it's advanced, there are still things that can be done for you and they will do whatever they can. Okay. Um, so allow me to play devil's advocate, if I may, Jane, <laughs> and ask you this. I mean, from my own point of view, yet again, I'm in a great advocate of positive mindset, the power of the mind to the point where it can overcome illnesses. And I fervently believe that. And I have proof of that with my own experience, uh, which are numerous. I suppose the question I put to you, Jean, is this, and it's a very, in some respects, almost, I wouldn't say insulting, but crude, black and white, yes, and, or, yes or no scenario. Do you feel that actually with a really strong, positive mind, that that contributes significantly to to overcoming cancer yes <laughs> there's there's nothing really else to say about it yes it does and there it depends how you and you work with your mind yes uh, mindset was incredibly important to start with hmm. um, my chemo friends and i the first thing we did was look at our mindset and not just our mindset on how, how we approached this but how we approached how we were going to look after ourselves what we what had we been doing wrong now i lived a lot of the time in the mediterranean so i had a pretty healthy diet but i was susceptible to certain things like lots of ice cream in italy so and it goes back beyond that it goes back to childhood what things you ate then what you did what you didn't do so mindset is incredibly important and if you can get in touch with your mind not your brain if you get in touch with your mind straight away and what my think what i discovered early on was uh, meditation yeah I, you know it's sort of the people power and all that sort of thing no it was brilliant and i do it now i mean i'm going through a slightly difficult time at the moment with family so my thing is to go somewhere quiet put on the earphones and do my meditating and it is brilliant try it once and you'll just see what it's like you have to do it more, more than once obviously because you have to get into a pattern mm -hmm. Mindset is the number one thing because your mind works and your brain works with your body, so they have to work in some. Okay, Jane. So you mentioned meditation there, and and yet again, I mean that's something that in a general sense I wholeheartedly subscribe to. But certainly, uh, when I work with clients uh, in the early stages of meditation, one of the comments that comes back consistently is, "My mind wanders. I can't. I can't concentrate. I can't focus." <laughs> yeah. As a, as a general comment, now I, I can only imagine yet again that for somebody that's dealing and battling with cancer, that distraction is multiplied many fold. Do you, do you care yet again to give us an insight into meditation and how that uh, that major distraction plays a part? Yeah, um, well, that's true. I found that as well. Um, I thought, oh, yeah, let's try meditation. I knew Deepak Chopra and all sorts of things. I thought, well, I'll give it a go. Um, I lay down on um, a yoga mat, and there were about six of us. We were at the, uh, what is it called, the something tree, at West London the West Middlesex Hospital, um, and they have a special place where you can go for quiet and everything else. Anyway, they had a meditation session, and I thought, I'm just going to try this. I lay down, and 10 seconds later, I thought, this is no good. I can't concentrate. I can't do this. I can't do that. And I, I stayed there. I actually got to the point where I nearly fell asleep. 
And to me, that was bliss because I'm a light sleeper. Later on, I suppose about a year later, I was talking to some people and um, I suddenly saw something online. And, I, and it said something along the lines of, yes, your mind has got so much in there. Most of it is rubbish. Don't worry about it. Let it be there. Recognize it and then move on. Don't try and get all your thoughts out because the more you try and get them out, the more you're thinking about, I can't get them out. Mm. So yeah. let it happen, just let it flow. And it sounds really a bit, um, but it's true. Let them, any thoughts you've got there, let them come in, say hello to them, say goodbye, say bye bye, get the next one and just let it happen. Relax because the more you think about it, the more stressed you become, the more impossible it is to do anything like that so just let it happen and move on yes and and from my own point of view uh, jane one of the tricks i use i suppose is is to use or to embrace my mind as my best friend and so when he wants to have a conversation that's fueled by a certain emotion i let him have his conversation mm. his noise his clutter wh whatever it is um, but particularly if it's a negative scenario, I don't let him go on too much. I allow that almost microsecond of um, verbalization, internal verbalization, to come out and say, okay, I hear you. I hear you, my friend. I know. I know all about it. And, and people think this is crazy, but it's actually that separation between us and our minds because we are not our minds. Our minds is a very, very, very massive part of us obviously mm -hmm. but no more different when i say to people oh what about your left toe or your right knee or your left finger or your right ear they're a key part of you but they are not they don't define who you are and neither does the mind and so it's embracing it as a best friend and as you quite rightly say in my opinion allowing it to have its its say but at the same time saying okay that's that's enough now let me have my say, please. And, and you know, people think that is crazy, but, it, but it's not because it gives it that separation that you are not your mind. It is a key part of you, but you are not your mind. And do, does that make sense? Is that something that you, you could possibly resonate with? Totally, yeah. Um, I have always gone for the thing of listening to your body, listen to your mind. It's rather like uh, when something nasty happens, you try and ignore it. I'm not suggesting this is nasty, but the more you ignore something, the more insistent it becomes yeah. and more imperative it seems to want to be. So to me, it, it seems silly to try and ignore this. A bit like a naughty school child who won't stop talking. You keep telling them to be quiet, be quiet, be quiet, and then they don't. They get all squeaky. Mm, Listen yeah. to them, let them have their say, and then... <laughs> You know, they, they've done their bit, and it is so right, and the mind is so important. You've had it all your life. It's been there protecting you, guarding you against all sorts of things, and it has accumulated every single thing you have ever done, seen, said in your life on this planet. So you need to be able to sort it out, help it sort itself out. If you do it together, you'll get through it a lot easier, like cleaning out a, an attic or something. For me, it is imperative that you treat your mind with respect, but you've got to give it guidelines as well. Yeah, I totally agree with that I, from a general perspective. And, I, and mm. I can only, as I say, I stress, I can only assume how that would play a part in this process too. So in terms of that process, Jane, we've spoken obviously about the, the positive strong mindset, um, touched upon the diet. Are there any other vital elements or ingredients that go to, um, you know, to win in this, uh, this uh, what's the most appropriate adjective here, this, this battle? Yeah, no, there I'm going to stop you because I don't call it a battle and I don't like calling it a battle. Okay. It, it's too aggressive. I mean, people do. Uh, and I hear people saying, although, especially relatives when they've just heard their um, dearly beloved one has got cancer. Oh, you can beat this. You know, you win the battle, knock the socks off it and all that sort of thing. I actually prefer to think of it either as a journey or even better as a challenge. But I know exactly what you're saying. It's, it's, it is something that is there. And I think um, the mindset, yes, is number one. I think that there are other 
qualifying, quantifying um, things that need to be taken into consideration. Certainly diet, definitely. Um, when you look what diets we had sort of 200 years ago, in fact, no, go back even further, our ancestors and what we are eating now. I heard someone say this, and I thought it was brilliant. It's the American diet versus the Mediterranean diet because what we should be doing is the Mediterranean diet. But uh, being half American, I can say this, the American diet is such rubbish. Um, it, it should be blown out of existence. It really should, along with certain people. But it, because this is being pushed so much as a wonderful thing. It's fast food time now. We're all too busy to cook, to sit around a table together. Um, so yes, diet is incredibly important. And that's why I say in your mindset, because the things you used to eat and you grew to love, how many of them are really good for you? Kids nowadays won't even look at vegetables. So you, there's a whole episode around that one. I think the, the other bit, which I go into a lot and was part of my thing, was I had, my lungs were severely compromised because of the chemo. Now, this is one of the side effects that they do mention. It can happen. I never had respiratory problems before. But the day after I had the first lot of chemo, my lungs were like they were burning. Standing next to a, um, an open fire, um, you know, bonfire, and suddenly the wind changes direction, you take a deep breath in, and all the smoke goes down. It's that burning feeling, and I had that, and I thought I was suffocating. So things you have to watch out for, I'm afraid, is your environment. It's very difficult nowadays because of so much pollution everywhere. The most you can really do is to be careful of... Um, you've been careful of what you eat. You need to be careful of what is around you. Um, cleaning utensils, um, you know, what you use to do, clean the house out with. Toothpaste as well, because what they've got in them. Uh, I'm not going to get mad like some people do and say, you've got to give all this, you know, you've got, you can't have any of these because they've got such and such in. We're all subject to chemicals, to toxins. But if you can be aware of what they are and where they are. I'm not suggesting you give them all up because that would be impossible, but just maybe not have so much of them. Um, just being aware of something that you didn't know about before can make such a difference. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, on that awareness note, Jane, um, that's something that I spend a lot of time talking about because in, in anything in life, for me, awareness is the starting point because you don't know what you don't know. And, you know, to raise awareness, and obviously you've touched on mindset, you've touched on diet, you've touched on environment, you know, if, if you can add just a little bit of improvement on, on all of those aspects, you put them together and all of a sudden, you you know, your awareness is, you're in a better place. Oh, yes. As, as, as a general, and I keep using this word, as a general approach. Um, yeah. So absolutely, totally believe in the awareness uh, and the power of awareness and certainly is the starting point for, for any journey no matter, or any learning, no matter what it may be. That is so true. And if you are aware of these things, you are aware of what happened to you when you were younger, your mind again. You know, did you eat loads of donuts? Uh, picking the poor old donuts again. What was your life like eating lots of chocolate and stuff like that? You loved it. You had a sweet tooth, but you came, became addicted to it. So if, you're, if you know that happened, you can do something about it. As you said, you don't know what you don't know. Mm. We also know nowadays what can cause, not everything, but what can cause cancer, the bad sugars, the bad fats, things like that. You need to be aware of that. If you are aware of that, yes, you can do something about it by having... Less of that, less of bad things in your environment, in a private environment. Make sure your mindset is set. So it's not a question, I'm going to do a Tescoism, so every little helps. The, the more you can get rid of and or change it to something more beneficial, more healthy, you are doing so much for your body and your body will pay you back a thousandfold because it will help you and it always will do. But you've got to help it. Your immune system is going to be shot your immune system has got to come back. And that's the way to do it. Look after each other. Absolutely. I, I like to say this, actually. I just say, you have a symbiotic relationship with your body and your mind. You've had it, as I said, you, you've been together all your life and you will be together until death. 
you need to be able to work in sync. And if you can do that in any form, you're on a winner. Okay. So mindset, diet, environment, treatment, Jane. What's your thoughts around treatment? Are there, di- you know, and, and I'm really sort of showing my ignorance in this subject matter, but are there different treatments, you know, conventional versus alternative? What's your views and experiences on treatment? Well, well, do another session for about five hours, and I'll tell you, it's just so <laughs> big and it is so, it's confusing. There is so much good information out there nowadays, but there is so much more which is fake, which is awful. People are trying to tell you you've got this, that, and the other. Um, treatments, um, specifically chemotherapy, it is, I mean, w- when you think, and I, I saw it when I went into, or the five of us saw it when we went into the chemo room, we all sat down, had our arms up, and they were trying to find a vein so they could put the, the needle in. And they were all, they had ground gowns. They had, they weren't uh, marigold gloves, but they they were thicker than that. They had masks over their faces. Um, They almost looked like they were going to do what have you, a bomb. Because chemotherapy drugs are so toxic. If they got a tiny bit of that on their hand or any part of their body, it would burn right through, like straight like acid. Um, If you need to go to the loo after you've been treated, I'm sorry to say that, like, there's a special loo you go to that the other people can't go. Uh, you have to be separated. Um, it is, you know, that just says it in a nutshell. And when you think that when you're going through chemotherapy, what is chemotherapy doing? It is killing off your cancer cells. Yeah, but what else is it doing? It's killing off millions and millions of really good, healthy cells that actually look after you. So no one knows the percentage of which goes, but. Also, because of chemotherapy, it is very likely that, ke- that cancer will come back again, even if you seem to have cleared it now. There will be secondary cancer. Um, it's, it's a work in progress. It's not doing terribly well at the moment, as far as I'm concerned, and I'm not the only one. There are people around the world saying, this is ridiculous, there's got to be better ways. Um, but the research is trying to get there. But it's taking time and it will take more time and more people will go through chemotherapy. I've known people have no problems at all. I've known people be absolutely on their backs for six months afterwards. They cannot move. They're having daily injections of other things to try and get them out of it, to try and get their body back, um, to try and get their immune system working again. didn't work. They just have to ride through it. Treatments, I mean, those are the basic ones. Those are the main ones. Of course, there are other, other ones. Um, surgery, that's fine, um, except for some people get a bit over, some surgeons get a bit over eager and take off more than they should. Um, that's not me saying that, that's other medical people saying that it, you should be working to take off only what you really need to. Did we need to take all those lymph glands out? Did we really need to take that breast off? Um, things like that. Um, Radiotherapy, I actually, as far as I know, didn't have any problems with it. As I say, it was a bore. But it did also mean that by the end of two-thirds of the way through the treatment season, of uh, sessions, um, I, had to, I stopped because it had done its job so well. So, you know, it, it's archaic, it's awful, it's, it, it shouldn't be happening, but we just have to take baby steps until... There will be a major breakthrough, and that will happen next 50 years. Um, people are saying, and I, I have people in, in the, um, well, I worked for a very major global pharmaceutical company for 10 years, and they said it's not going to happen anytime soon, but when it happens, it will knock your socks off, and it's going to be so different. Because we've got the basics here, we just need to put them together, and we need some space to do that because of the competition. Now, they're all, all the people who are developing cancer drugs, um, they're all doing it, obviously, in competition. They're, and they're sort of losing the way as far as the patient coming first. It's Unfortunately, it's profit coming first at our expense because they want the money for R&R, various other things, and to be number one in the pecking order. So it's, it's got a way to go, but it's going to get there. Just have to put up with it a bit longer. 
but it is nudging forward in your opinion it is nudging forward um for most of us it's going much too slow but it's better that it's you know some people are saying it's standing still but it's not it is actually going there but I look at places like, um, I have subscribed to Cancer Research UK, I have subscribed to the American Cancer Association, there is other to get updates and they give me the information as soon as it is, just before it's actually made public, it goes, hits the headlines. And I think this is great, they're doing all this stuff, but what are they doing, John? Chemotherapy. It doesn't look like they're doing any research into anything else. I was actually just looking something up this morning. They've developed a new drug which they will give someone um, to calm or to stop the cells shooting out stuff to kill the cancer drug. So it, puts, it makes it dormant. So you've got this other drug coming in on top of the drug you've already had. Then you will go back to that original chemo drug, and then they will put more of the other drug. So basically you end up with so many cocktails of different things, and this is where it gets to be really stupid, I think. And I, I know, I, I, again, I'm speaking for myself, but with my knowledge and knowledge of other people, we are all saying this cannot go on. You are making it into an absolute spiral of all these different medications to try and get one to achieve one end. What are you achieving? You're damaging livers, kidneys, pancreas, everything, all the organs are going through hell trying to cope with all these different things going through the system. Some are working, some aren't. Now, if you've got straightforward cancer and you can just go through do the chemo and that's it, fine. But that's not what your body's supposed to do. It's protecting you by sending out these transmitters, as they call them, to stop the other cells from exterminating the, um, the chemo um, juices going through you to try and stop it. So, I mean, that sounds, it's convoluted, but basically it's not straightforward and it won't be for a long time. When they can get through the thing where they can calm down the drug so it goes to the right place, there's a, a new way of doing it, just come in now, where you target the actual cells that are bad, the cancer cells, and you do not touch any of the other cells because it's not going through your veins, it's not going through your system. It is targeting like a laser and it just damages them. Now, that is not on in, in um, what have you, public release at the moment, but it's looking really good. So if we could, but it takes longer, it's more expensive because it takes more time to get them, you know, the patients in and out rather than just putting it around their bodies. You have to target it straight. So it's a bit more like actually a bit more radiotherapy. That looks exciting to me. And if that can be done, well, I don't know how long it's going to take, but that will be a really great step forward. Okay, so as you say, quite rightly, Jane, I mean, in terms of a time scale, nobody knows. So that being the case, and I kind of go back to the, the title um, that we set at the top of this conversation around cancer diagnosis, it's not a death sentence. So, you know, we, we've kind of picked up on, uh, you know, the individual aspects of mindset, diet, environment, treatments, etc., etc., but... What what would your advice be uh, in light of the the unknown, the uncertainty of a time scale to say, look, okay, so you've got this diagnosis. What it, you know? How would you then have a conversation with somebody? Say it was me, and I and I rang you and said, Jane, I've had this diagnosis. What the hell do I do? What would you say to me? I'd say the first thing to do is to sit down, calm down, go to a, go to your happy place, and sit there for a little while. Then I would say. How do you want to go forward? Do you want to go uh, tell your family, tell your friends, work people and stuff? Or best thing to do is get one of your best friends, and I say friends rather than family, because family can be overpowering at the stage. Get a level-headed friend who can be your big support. They can go to appointments with you and stuff. You, there are some things you need to sort out, but the main thing is how you're feeling at the moment. Then I would say, when you've got that sorted, go look at your diet. The sooner you start pumping in lovely, lovely fresh fruit and vegetables, the sooner you will be helping your immune system to fight what is going to go on in not too long a time. I mean, it depends how, how advanced it is, how soon you have to go in. Um, it could be months. 
But if you change your diet and start eating nice things, and this is what I have been doing with my program, um, is actually sitting down with people and saying, your mindset is gonna, got, has got to do this first. You've got to take out the rubbish, the old rubbish, and put in not new rubbish, but new thoughts, ideas, and, and procedures. The main thing is to start eating well, do some exercise. So basically, get your body moving in the right direction. And by doing exercise and stuff, you do take a lot of the stress and the panic out of the diagnosis itself. You are trying to, you are starting to concentrate your mind on other things, like how I'm going to get well from this, how I'm going to not beat it, but you know, cope with it. Me and my body are going to do great things. Okay. In a more general sense, Jane, I'm going to make an assumption, and obviously I have got no right and shouldn't make an assumption, but I would assume that your life has changed since the news of this, uh, to use your word, and, and, and I believe you're absolutely right, uh, challenge, not battle. Um, how, how has your purpose in life changed as a result of that, that, in, you know, that life intervention? My actual everyday life has changed quite considerably because from what I went through and my other friends, my chemo friends went through, from writing our journals, we produced a book about it all. The whole, we sort of amalgamated all our thoughts and yeses and noes and goods and bads. And from that, we developed a programme to help others go through or deal with it as we had done with three steps, which is obviously the mindset, healthy lifestyle, and your environment. By following that, um, there's a lot of people who can't do it for themselves, don't want to do it. And this is why, because I've done it, been there, done that, I've done it, and it works. I would love to share. I was feeling like hell most of the time, but the one thing I wanted to do was say, right, I'm feeling like hell. I want to not have other people feeling like hell. I want them to be able to take something from this whatever it happens to be, whether it's a whole lot or something, and say, oh, yes, I can work on that, or I can work with that. Oh, yes, I can change that. Write down what you eat in a week. How much of that is good? How much of it is bad? Get rid of the bad. Find something. Explore new foods. Explore new lifestyles, i.e. go for lovely long walks and nice days. Don't sit in front of the television or the computer all day. Or there's so many things you can change, which are very easy, and you can do it yourself, and you will then sit back and say, oh, I did that. Oh, yes, I'm, I'm feeling really good about myself. And it is amazing psychological warfare takes part and say, yeah, I'm doing this, and I'm going to keep doing it. And I think from that, you would say, and I'm having such fun doing this because I'm meeting all sorts of wonderful people, like myself. I would never have met you if I hadn't been doing this. And I have met loads of people who have beaten cancer by going not testing chemotherapy by doing it the plant-based way like our ancestors did they have defeated really aggressive cancers they've been given what well, they're told they were terminal three months to six months and five ten years later they are so healthy and having a wonderful life and that some, a couple of those, or a few of those, I think I've had a bit of a hand with, but it's happening around the world. But I have actually developed this. People have used it, and they, they are my best friends, and I love them. And every time I feel really, really bad, I just think about them. I think, no, you're not that bad. You got through it. You're here. You've helped people, and you've helped yourself. So my main thing in life now is to keep going with these, this program. I don't mind doing it one-on-one. -on -one. I'm quite happy to do it and take people through individually but do have a program which is obviously online um you can re reach more people that way um and and just keep doing it because there are so many people out there who get the diagnosis and are lost they do not know which way to go they're told what to do but that's just not it's not a solution for them they need to find their own way i feel i had to find my way and by doing that that means it's but I've come out the other side a lot happier and a lot better. And I want to keep doing that with other people. I really get a kick out of it because, you know, if I can do it, they can do it. Very inspiring, Jane. Very inspiring. So if people want to find you, I mean, where, where, you know, where would we get hold of you then? What's, um, what's your contact uh, details? Website. 
which is three steps against cancer.com um facebook page okay. three steps cancer um um, um, um that's, those are probably the best ways to do. I, I do have Twitter and stuff, but I've not used it yet. I'm, I'm new to Twitter. I swore I'd never use it because of Donald Trump, but I've got Twitter and Instagram, which I must get to grips with. Um, they can, if they, if anyone is listening would like to send, I'm not sure how you do this, send an email just to get in touch and find out more. It's three steps cancer at gmail.com. Three steps. Uh, I think step. for initial ways, that's probably the easiest way to do it because that's how everyone does it now. Uh, so that's, that's get to me, and I will be straight back to them. And if it's just for a chat, it's just wants to just look at things over. That's fine. If if they've got any questions, brilliant. I am here to help them. Uh, just to be clear on that, Jane, is that the number three, or are you spelling it three? Yeah, the figure three. Okay, so three steps count. on on that and on the. Um, email and on the Facebook. It's yeah. all three and number three. Okay. By way of summing up, Jane, I mean, I really do want to thank you for sharing your your insights and and you know the way you've come across uh, in such a positive manner and and taking on this uh, this challenge. I mean, I've been educated about my use use of words, and I know that words are critical. You know, you've uh, throughout this conversation used the analogy of keep eating you know loads of beef burgers etc etc well i do the same metaphorically with words and i say that if we keep feeding ourselves unhealthy words then emotionally and mentally we'll we will be unhealthy so on a personal level i thank you for uh, putting me in the right direction on that use of the word battle um, <laughs> Absolutely. I'm again, personal. <laughs> no, no, not at all. No, it's not. No, it's it's definitely not because. The only it's... thing for that is, is you don't want to be in conflict. This yeah. is how I feel about it. Yes. You are in a battle, and your body, everything, all of you is fighting it. But I don't like to think of it that way. I like to think of it as a challenge, um, because it is a challenge. It's going to challenge you to your max, but a challenge you can come out of unscathed. And you can also come out of it with a, a wonderful mindset that says, yes, we have been positive throughout. We have not been defeated. We've had some bad, bad times, some good times, but it's been good. The challenge, we have beaten the challenge. No, we've won the challenge. Is there anything else, Jane, by, by way of uh, summary now that you'd like to add to what we've spoke about? Anything at all to raise awareness even further? I think... Um, a Raising awareness is wonderful, and we're do I think around the world we're doing a great job now because it's becoming, you know, with the social media that we've got, the, the tools that we've got to use, it is getting there. <clears throat> there are still some things to be slightly cautious about. GPs do not recognise alternative or plant-based things. They say no, <clears throat> um, because they are paid by the pharmaceutical companies to use their products. Therefore, they cannot condone it, they cannot sponsor it, they cannot go by it. What I have done, I, I did with my GP, I said, look, I want to, this to happen and I want to do this after I've done all the chemo. So I'm going, instead of having checkups every three, six months, I'm going to go on a really, not strict, but a really, really good set diet, health craze, and I want you to monitor me. Will you do that? Uh, not just chuck me out and say, you're, you're doing stupid things. And other people have done that. The, the GPs will monitor them. And the good thing about that is, not only do you find out that you're doing the right thing and it's working, but they find out, your GP finds out and says, oh, I say that is working. So you're sort of almost getting them on board, even if they're not allowed to. If you want to do something, you per persevere with it. Don't panic. If you think you're going to panic or if you feel panicky, uh, the hearts are racing. Sit down and just let it go. Put some music on. Uh, but just, and do not be swayed by other people, whether it be family or friends. Do not let them talk to you. Oh, I've just read on the internet that you should be doing such and such. No, no, no. Uh, if, if you really want to contact someone, get hold of McMillan support online if you want to, or phone them up. That's what they're there for. Or phone me up. Contact me. I'm really happy to do it because there is so much good stuff out there, but there's so much bad stuff. But what I want people, first of all, to think of 
is themselves. I am not in a good place. I am going to come out of that place with flying colors. What do I do? I think about it and then I go forward. Whichever way you go forward, make sure it's forward and not going sideways or backwards. It sounds all very parabolic, this, but it does work. I know lots of people who've done this and they are happier by far. And again, if I can help in any way, I am here to do so. Jane, once again, thank you very much. And all that remains now for is, is to say to the listeners, I hope you've got some value out of that, some uh, you know, some real deep insights around um, this, this challenge called cancer. And, and remember, the cancer diagnosis, it's not a death sentence. Until the next time, take care and see you soon. Thanks for listening to the Mastering the Game of Life podcast. Drop a line to paul at paullowhearts.com with any thoughts or questions you may have, and he'll be more than happy to respond. Alternatively, check out Paul's website at paullowhearts.com or any of his social media feeds under the same name. Remember, mastering life starts by embracing our hearts.